Now, so far, for simplification, we assume that everything is deterministic. There is no uncertainty. In other words, we are implicitly, what we are we were explicitly assuming that consumers have the perfect foresight about what the future dividends will be like, what the future consumption will be like. Okay, but in reality, of course, there is some uncertainty. We are not 100% sure about the evolution of future dividends. We are not 100% sure about future GDP. Okay? So it's good if we can incorporate such uncertainty into the model. And that way, the application of the model for future prediction or forecast becomes easier or more straightforward. So let's move on to the model economics <coughs> with uncertainty. Economy with So suppose there are three possible states in the future. State 1, state 2, and state 3. I mean, of course, there can be 1,000 different scenarios in the future, but you know, whether you have only three states or 1,000 possible states in the future, math is almost the same. Okay, if you have a good computer, it's fine to have 1,000 possible states in the future, but for today's purpose, let's make it just three. So summer is coming, and the coming summer can be really hot. But the temperature can be relatively mild, or the coming summer can be rather chilly. And economists' clever idea is that even if it is the same good, the same goods in two different states can be regarded as two different commodities. So for an umbrella, an umbrella on a rainy day, an umbrella on a sunny day can be considered as two different goods. They can have, they can give you different utilities, they can, they can have different equilibrium prices. Same for 100 pounds of potatoes. 100 pounds of potatoes when you are rich and full, and 100 pounds of potatoes when you are poor and hungry can be regarded as different goods, okay? They can have different prices, so let's denote the price of the state one potato, P1, and state two potato, P2, and state three potato, the price of the state three potato, P3. So these are the current prices of one unit of state contingent consumption goods or potatoes. I'm not saying that these are not future prices of potatoes. These are not future prices of potatoes. I'm not saying that at, in the future, if state one realizes it, the potato price will be P1. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that in the future, if the summer is mild, the price of one in the potato will be P2. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that today, before the future state realizes, we don't know which state will realize. Today, if you want to buy these future potatoes, these are the prices that are applied today. So if you pay P1, P1 
pounds or p1 dollars or p1 potatoes, whatever the unit is today, before the future states realize. Today, if you pay p1, you can buy one unit of state one potato. Meaning that in the future, if state three realizes, you won't get anything. But if state one realizes, you will receive one unit of potato. OK? Does that make sense? Good. So these prices are also called state prices. Yeah, it's like future future prices, right? Forward, forward prices. No, forward, not forward prices. Um, no, you pay this much, P1. If state 1 realizes, you get one unit of potato. You pay P3 today. If state 3 realizes, you will get one unit of potato. OK? And these are called state prices, or they are also called arrow-debris prices. Names after two Nobel laureates, Kenneth Arrow and uh, Gerard Debreu. Now suppose, let's say today, it's not summer yet, so they have no idea which state will actually realize. And here's, here is Jack, the beer seller. And here is James, the fish and chip seller. Fish and chip seller. And Jack knows that he doesn't know which state we will realize, but he knows that if state one realizes, the summer will be hot and uh, he can sell a lot of beer, so his income will be as high as 100. He will have 100 potatoes if state one realizes. He knows that if state two realizes, the temperature is relatively will be mild and the beer doesn't sell as much, he will have only 30 units of income, 30 potatoes. If state 3 realizes, the summer will be chilly, and he will have only very little income, only 10 potatoes. James, on the other hand, knows that if state 1 realizes, the summer is too hot, people don't buy much uh, fish and chips, and his income will be only 10. He will have only 10 potatoes, I mean consumption goods, in, day two, uh, in state 1. If, if state 2 realizes, his income will be higher. And if state 3 realizes, he will have 100 units of consumption goods. As it is, it is a little risky. I mean, having 100 potatoes in state 1 would be great if state 1 actually realizes. But ex ante, before knowing which state will realize, this is far from ideal. Now what they can do is to trade. The Jack, Jack says, hi James, why don't we trade? I'll give you 50 units of potatoes if state one realizes. You give me 60 potatoes if state three realizes. And this exchange rate, of course, depends on the current prices of these future state contingent goods. Yeah? So far so good? Now, you can see that this is, the math is exactly the same as, you know, exchanging apples and bananas and coconuts. Same math. as in exchanging apples and bananas. But 
they sound a little different. It sounds more like, but sounds more like, you know, betting or mutual insurance. Yeah? Bet or insurance. In, in finance, bet and insurance and derivatives are the same, so. Because today, before knowing which state we'll realize in the future, they cannot actually trade potatoes. These potatoes are not yet there. What they are actually trading is some securities, a promise, So in this trade, Jack issues some piece of documentation which says I, Jack, will give or pay one unit of consumption good if to, to the owner of this paper to the owner of this paper, if state one realizes, and only if state one realizes. With his signature, and basically, he is issuing Fifty units of this document to Jack, I mean James, and James issues similar document that promises to pay one unit of consumption good if state three realizes. Yeah, James issues sixty units of such documents to Jack. And this is what they actually exchange. And this is called state contingent state contingent good or state contingent claim. It's called state contingent good because you're buying future good, but whether you can actually have this good or not depends on which state will actually realize in the future. So far so good? Now, if we know the prices of future goods, P1, P2, P3 for state 1, state 2, and state 3. Pricing an asset is an easy matter. Let's say asset X is Budweiser's share. And let's say if state one realizes summer is hot and the payoff, the value of the share is one, will be 100. If state two realizes, the value will be 30. And if state three realizes, then the payoff, the value of this share will be 10. What's the price of this share? What's the current price of this share? The idea is that. An asset is a basket of future consumption goods that the asset promises to pay. And as such, the price, current price, is P, uh, 100P1 plus 30P2 plus 10P3.
What about call option? Call option for this share of Budweiser with strike price equal to 20. Remember, for the call option, the payoff of, the, of a call option at the expiration date is either zero or the price of the underlying asset minus the strike price. If state one realizes, the value of this call option will be 100 minus 20, that's 80. If state three, two realizes, that's 30 minus 20, that's 10. If state three realizes, then the value of this call option will be simply zero. So the current price of this call option is 80 P1 plus 10 P2 plus 0 P3. What about, ri what about risk free bond? Risk free asset. That pays one unit of good, whichever state may realize. The current price is P1 plus P2 plus P3. You are buying one unit of one of each state contingent good. So the total cost is P1 plus P2 plus P3. So in other words, the risk free rate. is the inverse. I mean, you can subtract one. If you subtract one, it's called net risk-free rate. If you don't subtract one, then it's called gross, gross rate. Okay, It's not a big deal. In general, If an asset pays D1 or D2 or D3 units of consumption goods in states 1, 2, and 3, respectively, the current price, an asset with this much uh, payoffs, future payoffs, has the price, current price, equal to P1 D1 plus P2 D2 plus P3 D3. Basically, the weighted sum of future payoffs. Here, the weights are the state prices. Now, the weights do not sum up to 1. Here, weights do not necessarily sum up to 1. So we can modify this by dividing and multiplying, multiplying and dividing by P, P1 plus P2 plus P3. So this is equal to P1 plus this is equal to P1 plus P2 plus P3 times P1 over P1 plus P2 plus P3 times D1 plus P2 over P1 plus P2 plus P3 times D2 plus P3 over P1 plus P2 plus P3 D3. I mean, I just divided by the sum of the state prices and at the same time, multiplied the sum of the state prices. So this first expression 
and the second expression are exact, exactly identical. And after doing that, if we, if we call these parts q1 and q2 and q3, they sum up to 1. And they are called Do you know what they are called? They are called risk neutral probabilities. Risk neutral They are called probabilities. They have nothing to do with actual probabilities. But they are called probabilities because they satisfy all math math mathematical features of probabilities. They are always non-negative. They always sum up to one. They satisfy product rule and summation rule of probabilities. So they are non-negative. They sum up to one. So they are called risk-neutral probabilities. Probabilities, they are called risk-neutral because it seems like, you know, this is asset price, right? And asset price is, if they were actually probabilities, they are not, but if they were actually probabilities, it seems like the asset price is equal to the expected value of future payoff discounted by the risk-free rate. Discounted by Sorry, discounted by risk free rate. Yeah. But who would simply discount by risk free rate? Who would simply discount expected payoff by simply risk free rate without any risk premium? Risk neutral person. Okay? So if they were probabilities, that must be the they must be the probabilities that risk-neutral people would have in mind. So they are called risk-neutral probabilities. But again, they have nothing to do with actual likelihood of these future states. They are called probabilities because they satisfy mathematical conditions of probabilities. Yeah. One more line. Question is, of course, if we know P1, P2, P3, we can price any asset. But the question is, how these P1, P2, P3 are determined? P1, P2, P3 should be, of course, determined in economic equilibrium demand equal supply. Okay? They should be determined. by economic equilibrium with UTT maximizing individuals. Okay, so let's continue next week.